Well, good afternoon. Right at one o'clock. I'm, <laughs> I'm Bob Surridge. I'm Vice President of the Southwark Historical Society. And uh, Liz is going a little down into the weather. It's a beautiful weather. It's all, it's almost feels like fall. But uh, she won't be she won't be here today. Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you for for coming. This is we're kind of going back and forth between Zoom programs and and in person programs, and it's nice to, nice to see folks uh, in in person. Right? Uh, right now is kind of a big time for the Southport Historical Society in that our commemorative brick program started um, October 1st, and will will be uh, <clears throat> commemorative bricks are for sale until the end of November this year. And these are, how many are familiar with the, with the brick program? Okay, all right. For the rest of you, these are either four by eight bricks or eight by eight bricks that you can um, use to commemorate a, a, love, a loved one, uh, to memorialize someone, or to commemorate a special event that in your, in your life, or just the fact you're happy to be here in South, South Point. <laughs> And uh, it's it's a lot of fun. We do a in the in the spring. We'll do a a special program event uh, in in May about the brick program, and we'll combine that with some other other activities. The other thing you might want to know is that the thirty uh, first Christmas home tour will be done this year. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> especially, especially there. Okay, uh, we haven't done the, the home tour for the past two past two years, obviously because of because of COVID. Uh, but we're we're planning and working, and we think we have most of it together for for this year. And that will be the second Saturday in December, as it's been for thirty. I don't know how many years, but it's been for many years. That's December tenth this year. Do you still need more docents? Still need more docents. Where do we sign up? Where do you sign up? Info at Southward Historical Society dot org. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. I think it's the same day as the flotilla too. Yeah. They have the oh, It's part of Winterfest. It's and part and of the yeah. Southward's yeah. Winterfest program, okay. which is like a I think a ten day celebration of of winter. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me introduce uh, Desi. Bridge. <laughs> um, Desi has really interesting. She has a, a, a baccalaureate degree in, in history, which she combines with a, a real deep interest in the medical medical field, mm -hmm. and also um, a degree from Johnson Wales. So she's a a. Well, at least a culinary his historian. We'll get yes. the med something we'll figure out how to get the medical <laughs> the culinary historian. And today it's kind of an intriguing title that she has, Nefarious Plants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, for coming in. It's nice to see folks in person. Um, I don't mind doing Zoom, but it's still nice to kind of be in an actual space with folks. Those of you that came in later, I've already told those in the beginning, I have seasonal allergies. I am negative, so if I get a little phlegmy or something, I've got my water here. No need to worry whatsoever. I've got cough drops, too, if need be. Mm -hmm. um, my background is kind of strange, so I've worked at, I've been lucky I should say, to work at museums where we were doing what is now sometimes called experimental archaeology. So I've worked at locations where we had extensive records that we would look at what people would have done in the past and then try to duplicate it in modern times to better understand how their lives would have been historically. Uh, while working more so at Old Town Museums and Gardens in Winston-Salem, I kind of narrowed in on medical and then plants. And that's because oftentimes the two go hand in hand. Culinary was also the same way. I fell in love with brick ovens. Uh, when I went to Johnson & Wales, it was really for baking and pastry because I wanted to figure out what the chemical science was going on when one was baking, whether they're using a modern oven or a traditional wood fire bake oven. Now, I'm just going to real, real, real quick go over medical lore for you and the fact that historically when people are using a lot of these plants we're going to be talking about today, 
for medicine, they're basing it on thousands of years of trial and error. They're basing it on previous thoughts and doctrines, might be going all the way back to, let's say, 600 AD with Galen's theory. You might be going forward a little bit to the 1500s, where you start to see the beginnings of what we would call germ theory. And then this practice is even going to continue on a little bit after the 1860s, where Louis Pasteur comes about and creates the modern scientific thought of germ theory. Because just like today, not everyone's going to embrace something new that comes about. And they might be willing or wanting to try remedies that they're familiar with or a family member said worked. A lot of these plants are beneficial and they did help and they still help today. It could just be in modern medicine, we're using a synthetic version instead of the actual plant itself. That said, they're also basing sometimes a lot of their medical treatments on an idea of like the doctrine of signatures, where something that looks like an ailment or a body part in nature, it's automatically going to cure you for it. Now, again, this is a hit or miss thought process. A good example is wormwood here. Um, I have this growing all over my yard. I absolutely adore wormwood. You're going to have to eat a lot of this before it's going to make you sick in high concentrations. But if you ever get tinctures or um, extracts, just be very gentle in how much you use of wormwood. It is in the mint family, kind of a distant relation. Um, it curls up in on itself as it starts to wilt. And people historically said, well, it kind of looks like worms. We should try it for parasites and intestinal worms because... You are not boiling your water. You're not cooking your meats to certain temperatures like we do today. So if you look at journals and diaries of the past, you're going to see intestinal problems rank up there pretty high on a daily basis of things that are bothering folks. Interestingly enough, wormwood, they do believe, they're still studying it, can help with basically flushing the body of parasites and intestinal worms. Again, if you come across that today, please go seek modern medicine <laughs> and talk to your doctor. Do not try self-medicating yourself with wormwood. But this is an example of a plant that truly did work. And again, it could just be through trial and error. A lot of times, though, what you might see is the placebo effect uh, occurring. Now, as I'm talking about some of these plants, we're going to embrace and have quite a few of them in our gardens. Others, we're going to scream and run in the opposite direction if we come across them. The ones that I mentioned that might be toxic and poisonous in your garden, you may very well be aware of it. Please, after this talk, do not go home and feel like you need to rip it out of your garden. Just be a little more aware if you didn't know about its toxicity, about small children and cats and dogs, or maybe that one random adult you know that likes to just pick things and put them in their mouth. Um, they should stay away from that plant and perhaps just use it for its ornamental um, purposes in your garden. We're going to start out kind of out in the wilds and then we're going to slowly work our way into the garden. I am going to real quick though go through a list of plants that we are not going to talk about today but they are poisonous and again just be aware of when they're in your garden and you again might be familiar with a lot of these. Jimson wheat mountain laurel, Chinese lanterns, yellow dock, which we're going to talk about yellow dock in a little bit, rosary pea, tobacco, I think everyone knows about that one, castor oil plant, rhubarb, I think everyone knows about that one too, it's the leaves that you've got to worry about with rhubarb, wisteria, lilies, all oh, lilies, keep them in the garden, dumb cane or elephant eater, hydrangeas, which do have quite a bit of cyanide in them, but again, just plant it. Don't eat it. And you're going to be fine. <laughs> Rhododendras and those beautiful, beautiful azaleas that we love. And then philodendra. So all these plants are technically a toxic plant, but again, it depends on their level of toxicity. Also, it's basically going to be consumption you're going to have to worry about. Some of these plants might cause a form of dermatitis if you brush up against it, but it's all going to depend on a person's sensitivity. Um, in fact, Bob and I were talking about a plant I'll be mentioning in just a little bit that you'll come across some folks that are highly allergic to, others blissfully unaware that they're brushing up against it, it never affects them. 
Now going back into the wilds, I'm going to first talk about a plant that some of you may not have in your garden, you may be familiar with, or if you have at home, maybe you have an atrium, and that's carnivorous plants. Now we're lucky enough in North Carolina to have quite a few carnivorous plants living not just on the east coast, but you can also find them in other parts of North Carolina, even up in the mountains. In the world, there is right now 860 carnivorous plants. And they range from the one we're very familiar with, or most people are, the Venus flytrap, to perhaps my favorite, the beautiful pitcher plant, to bladderwort, sundrop, and then your bladderwort, which is just an interesting plant unto itself. They're called carnivorous plants because they are going to be feeding off the victims that they have attracted to their home or to their, their plant itself. Venus fly traps can be the size of your thumbnail or a little bigger. You can go up to Wilmington and see them um, in select areas. They're a delicate plant. They're important to the ecosystem, but we're starting to see problems with overdevelopment in areas where you would naturally find them. Um, they're open. They look like little tooth clawed plants. We'll have a little piece sticking out on either side, almost looks like a soft thorn. What they're waiting for is a bug to land in there and hit those two pieces within 20 seconds. Then it's going to slam close and it's going to feast. If this plant gets enough food, it will flower. When it flowers, it puts off a long stalk and its flowers are up high because it doesn't want to trap and eat its pollinators. Now, I'm going to be doing a talk later on in February close to Valentine's Day called the Scandalous Labs of Plants. And I'll go into more detail around that time period about what some of these plants might be doing to make sure that they get the pollinators compared to their neighbors. Um, pitcher plants, I think they're absolutely beautiful. Um, they range in sizes too. With a pitcher plant, it's going to have the liquid the insect gets in, can't get back out. Um, there are reports over on the other side of the world in vast jungles that supposedly pitcher plants get so large that rats have gotten into them and can't get back out and get eaten. Um, <laughs> there's been one or two documented cases of it, but we're not exactly sure if this is a common occurrence or if that was just a really tiny rat. It got down into the pitcher pot and bless the poor thing it just maybe it was sick it just couldn't figure out how to get back out of it but typically your pitcher plants are going to be eating some form of an insect maybe even a lizard or something like that will fall into it um bladder warts are aquatic your um sundews look almost like the inside of a fresh fig if you cut it open and then slice it thin and unfurl it it's got all these little sticky tendrils that are going to catch the insect and then curl up in onto itself. Um, it's often known as kind of the fly trap of nature. And then your bladder, or not bladder, or excuse me, your um, butterwort, it just secretes this really interesting sac. <laughs> we'll just say that. And the um, or insects will get trapped on it and then eat. Now, moving away from our carnivorous plants, a plant that is actually really good for the ecosystem and we tend to hate is poison ivy. Poison ivy, yes, you should not have it in your garden. No, you should not burn it. Don't touch it. Get rid of it. But if it's in the wild, leave it alone. Just respect it and give it its place because it's an important food source for quite a few animals. White-tailed deer actually like to eat the leaves of it. Birds love the berries, poison ivy. Now, poison ivy is documented first over on the other side of the world, about 7th century China. Then it's mentioned again in 10th century Japan. We don't see it in Europe, so Western Civ is kind of oblivious to it until they come over here to the States. Um, sumac and poison ivy do grow here in North Carolina native. Again, if you see it growing wild, give it a wide berth, but it is a beneficial plant to have within your garden or outside of your garden area, I should say. Another plant that you can find here that you may not be as familiar with, but doesn't usually react as well to folks, 
is your woodland nettle and over in Europe your stinging nettle. Now, nettles have kind of worked their way back into folkloric traditions. One, it is being used as a treatment for arthritis. Also, your foraging culinary chefs have discovered it. <laughs> and they're using it for all kinds of teas and salad dressings and such like that. You can eat the stained greens of nettle. You just have to properly blanch them before you start cooking it. And supposedly the baby uh, leaves that come up, you can eat those plain. I, I wouldn't recommend it either, blanch those too, just to be careful. But I have had uh, stinging nettle um, oil and it, it's really good. It's a very, very, very fresh green flavor. Uh, I'm gonna rank it right in there with, again, if any of you are familiar with me, you know how much I love dandelions. Um, it's really up there with fresh dandelion leaves. You just can't touch it. It just tastes like spring when you're able to get those into your diet. They also are high in vitamin C. So stinging nettles would have been um, a good source of food to get into your system as we go into spring, especially coming out of winter when you didn't have a lot of food sources available. Now our nettles tend to be up in the mountains here in North Carolina. Stinging nettle has worked its way over from the Atlantic and is starting to work its way into North Carolina itself. I had the lovely instance of frolicking across the field in England, not realizing what stinging nettles were and came across them. So I can tell you, it is unbelievably uncomfortable. <laughs> if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, it's ranked right up there. Now, supposedly growing always with your stinging nettles is going to be another plant and um, that's going to be yellow dock and they say if yellow dock is growing with it yellow dock is going to cure you of the stinging nettles i don't know if that's true or not but you do see quite a few people using that now you're not always going to find yellow dock growing with your nettles the same as they're saying that um ginseng weed will cure you of poison ivy rashes. It's not always in the same area. There's this folkloric belief that the two always grow together because it's this symbiotic relationship of nature. It's going to hurt you but save you at the same time. I don't think nature's really thinking like that. <laughs> um, your poison ivy can grow in many different locations whereas your jimson wheat has certain types of soil conditions that it needs to grow well. And it's the same with your yellow dock and your nettles. Now, if you do happen to come across any nettles and get stung, the best thing is to just wash and go see a doctor and make sure that you're not gonna have some form of reaction to it. That's the biggest problem today with a lot of these plants that we do not come into contact with on a regular basis is we may have a stronger adverse reaction to them because we're living in a slightly more closed off world than we would have historically. Um, that said, I've also met people, especially when I lived up in Asheville, who had severe arthritis in their hands and they went out of their ways when they would go hiking in the mountains. If they saw it, they would rub it against their knuckles and they said it did alleviate the pain in their knuckles and wherever they had arthritis. So. I don't recommend doing that unless you see a doctor and talk to them, but there might be some basis behind those plants. Speaking of plants that can sting, um, another plant that we have locally that is notorious for being grouchy is yucca or yucca. I've heard it pronounced both ways. It depends on you. Uh, it does put off a beautiful flower. I absolutely love this plant, but it is a vicious mean plant, in my opinion. <laughs> you try to just get anywhere near it, even if it's to make it feel better, it's gonna stab you. Uh, the problem with this plant is it's very sharp, and when it stamps, it's gonna release a little bit of its toxins into that wound, which can damage the red blood cells in that area. Uh, the root itself is where most of the toxicity is located, which if you ever come across people that eat the roots of this plant, they're going to be preparing it prior to get the toxics out or the chemicals out prior to eating the actual yucca plant itself. Um, 
We see records of early explorers when they come across this plant, actually sending it, quite a few of them were harvested off the coast of North and South Carolina's um, islands actually, were sent back over to Europe and used as ornamental plants and gardens. We do see some records of Native Americans in America on the East Coast using the fibers of the plant. Um, there's some records of them using it for aprons, um, maybe fiber in the homes. There are also records of those explorers that first came to the Caribbean that say they do not see yucca being used by the Native peoples, but in all fairness, most of these explorers coming over were not approaching these people with a anthropological thought process. So it could be they were using the yucca beyond a food substance and they just weren't documenting um, what was being done down there. If you have yucca growing in your garden, enjoy it. Just give it a wide berth when you go in. Go in with the strongest gloves possible. <laughs> Wear really, really thick jeans and maybe another layer. <laughs> and if you get pricked, just immediately wash the wound. Um, put maybe even a little triple antibiotic on it and you should be good to go. But uh, yes. I have a question. I've had yucca fries. Mm -hmm. Is that? The it's the root. Yes. They're delicious. It is delicious. Yeah. I mean, you can eat the root. You just, you want to make sure basically you're pulling out, um, you can bake it basically to a high enough um, temperature in a long enough time. It's going to kill off what is going on, the chemical compound of the root itself, which will cause adverse reactions. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel comfortable doing that at home, which I can understand, then you can easily go online and find where people have already processed the root, and then you can take it to the next stage in your cooking or baking. So it is edible, it just needs some prep work prior to getting it to the stage. It's the same with the nettles. If you don't feel comfortable blanching and cooking up your own nettles, then feel free to go online and find someone that's already done that and they're certified and you can get it and take it home and use it yourself. Um, if you're anything like me, I'm one of those paranoid people. I think I did it properly and then afterwards and I know I've done it properly, I'm like, my throat's a little itchy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> So I start saying, I'm like, I don't know if I did it properly. I don't think I should do that again. I do that when I eat fish all the time. And that horrible person was like, is that a bone? No. Okay, I'm good. Was that a bone? No, okay, I'm good. So if you're like me and a bit paranoid, best bet is just to go with someone that's been doing this quite a few times and they know what they're doing on that level. Now, moving on from uh, eucaryaka, we're now definitely firmly going into your garden. And most of the plants I'm going to be talking about now are not native species. Uh, first up is foxglove. Does anybody know what its medical name is? Digitalis. Yes, yes. I think everyone's aware. Yeah. Foxglove digitalis is a beautiful plant, but it is a plant that can cause some issues if one is to get it into their system on a high enough dose. If anything, if you've read a mystery novel, mm -hmm. at some point, someone's gonna put in there digitalis as a secret weapon for killing someone or causing heart distress. Now, what is interesting about foxglove is the fact that, so I'm gonna sneak back to my notes real quick. You do see in 1733, a Sir Stephen Hales figuring out in his kitchen here how to, or not here in Southport, excuse me, but his kitchen during that time period, figuring out how to properly dose someone with digitalis, with their basically what we will call blood pressure or beats per minute. And that just fascinates me that in 1733, You've got someone sitting there saying, okay, we know it's good for the heart, but we oftentimes overdose these folks <laughs> or we underdose them. How can I figure out? So he's using the tools of his era to get to that level. Now that said, prior to that time period, you do see, um, or excuse me, that was 1785 is the account into blood pressure. I'm sorry, I misquoted. 1733, Sir Stephen Hales is the one that figured out blood pressure by using horses. Um, he would basically distress the horses, get their heart rate up, and he was measuring their accelerated heart rate to figure out blood pressure. And then in 1785, 
we have digitalis being used as a treatment in a more scientific method for how you could dose a person properly. You also have Lily of the Valley, which would have been used for any type of heart problem historically. And I oftentimes will have people ask, well, back then they didn't know any better. They just, you know, medicated higgly piggly. Well, you have good doctors today and you have bad doctors today. And it's the same back then. So you do see records of physicians being aware of how dangerous these two plants were, but saying this was the only thing we had to medicate at this point. Let's see how to go. And oftentimes, if you look at the records, they're going to start out with a small dose and they're going to wash the symptoms as they go, just like your physician typically does today. So not all people, the medical profession in the past were snake oil salesmen and women. I, I kind of sometimes feel like in, I blame movies and TV shows on this. Um, too often we think that the way our brain works today is a very modern marvel and that our ancestors weren't logically thinking on the level we are today. It's just their technology was a, a little different. How can you tell if someone is getting too much Lily of the Valley or Foxglove? You can tell a couple ways. Uh, they're going to start becoming breathless. Most of the time a sign of poisoning is vomiting and diarrhea. Um, you're also going to have blurred vision. Oftentimes you might even see throat swelling with anyone. So if you know of anybody that's been out in your garden and you have any of these plants and they come and show any symptoms, you might want to take them in to, to see a doctor. Um, that was typically what your physicians of the past would have been looking for as they were giving these folks uh, tinctures and tonics and other types of medications based on these plants that they had in their garden. Does anyone know where supposedly the um, name foxglove comes from? There's a whole bunch of folklore myths of where the originated story is. But one that I love is the fact, and you see this over in England quite a bit, foxes are sneaky creatures. And sometimes they need to be even quieter than usual. So they found this plant that when they picked off the flower petals and slipped it on, it created little gloves <laughs> so that they could stealthily move into your area and take what they wanted and stealthily go back out without anyone seeing them or hearing them. Um, they're often sometimes attributed to the fair folk or the fairy folk, and there is belief in certain areas of America and over in Europe that to bring the plants into the home is ill luck. And you're, if you pick the plant, even if you're not bringing it into your home, you're going to upset those that live in your garden that you may not see during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of superstition and folklore that falls into foxglove. It's the same, I'm gonna ping back real quick to nettles. Has anyone in here ever read the Hans Christian Andersen uh, fairy story, The uh, Wild Swans? That's a, I love that story. And in that, Nettles features prominently the princess's brothers, who are all princes, have been turned into swans to convert them back to their human form. She has to quietly, she is not allowed to speak a word, she has to pick the nettles, she has to turn them into thread, and then she has to make them each a coat. So she every day is withstanding all of the horribleness that you can get from Nettles. And at the end, she either is successful and they all are reverted back to human form or the youngest brother, she doesn't put the sleeve on and so he's left with a wing. Um, there's slight variations to the story, but all these plants I'm talking about do have a, a deep, deep, deep folklore and are used a lot in fairy tales and if I had more time, I would delve a little deeper into. Now the next plant I'm gonna be talking about is mint. I mentioned earlier wormwood and mint are kind of in the same family. They have a chemical when produced in strong amounts can cause epileptic seizures. Uh, you really have to eat a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of mint if you're going to get to that route. Now what's nefarious about mint, and you all may have experienced this if you've done what I've done in the past, is it is nefarious to its neighboring plants. Mint doesn't like neighbors. 
if you don't put it in the ground in a pot where it's contained, it is going to spread. It is going to steal every nutrient and moisture out of the soil, and it's going to kill off its competitors, especially your spearmints. Now, I have done that in one of my gardens. Um, thus far, I've actually been able to contain it because I put highly aggressive plants in there with it, and I'm letting them have epic battle, and each year I'm documenting it. And I'm, I'm actually enjoying it. Um, seeing who is fighting and who is winning, and thus far, the mint is being contained within that area. If you do not want to go that route, just keep it in a pot or make sure when you put it down in the ground that you are going to put in some more aggressive plants, especially plants that are going to grow taller than the mint itself. Because if you start blocking out its sun, the mint <laughs> isn't going to do as well. Um, another plant that you can see being aggressive I have this in my yard it was it came with the yard is your Mexican petunia Mexican petunias you can't get rid of them I mean you have to get there and I love them too but you have to get in there and get every little bit of the rhizome out of the Mexican petunia so that's another nefarious plant it's not toxic to humans or cats and dogs that I'm aware of, boy, your other plants in the garden are gonna scream when they see it show up. Because it's the same thing as mint. It's just gonna spread and it's gonna take over. You cut it back and it gets bushier and bushier and bushier. Now, what I've done is I've put it in two selected areas. I've also moved it into pots in quite a few places because I, I'm just, I don't have the time to dig up every little bit of its rhizome in my soil. By doing a heavy pruning and again putting more aggressive plants in with it, it's behaved itself. And it's actually stayed in its one little area. If it starts getting a little too crazy, I will become a little more aggressive with my garden tools and getting it out. But it's great for pollinators, which is why I like having it in there. So, and it's beautiful. And I actually prefer keeping it at about four feet height. It tends to have a hardier stalk. It doesn't fall over as much, I've noticed, on windy or cold days. Um, another thing, and I'm not sure what's going on with mine, is it's keeping its blooms all day long. So I, I don't know if my aggressive tactics is forcing it to be aggressive back, but whereas in the past it was long and leggy and sparse, it's now compact and it's keeping its purple flowers throughout the day. And I've also noticed the purple flowers are getting a darker and darker hue, which I'm particularly keen on. Um, whereas when they were later, before I would notice a, a pinker tinge was starting to come in on them. But those are two plants. Like I said, you put them in your garden and your other plants that are like to play nice, we'll say that, are probably not going to be as keen to see them. Unless it's Lantana. Oh, we'll be talking about Lantana. <laughs> The next plant I'm talking about is lantana. Lantana, and I have that also in my yard. Um, I love lantana. I love the scent of it. I think it's a beautiful plant. When you keep it controlled, it's beautiful. But lantana has become invasive in quite a few places of North America. Um, the problem with it is it will go out and create a shrubland where there should not be a shrubland because it's going to systematically take over an area and kill off all the other plants that it can. It's especially problematic in your citrus groves. In parts of Florida, they're having problems with it. In orchards, they'll have problem with lantana also. It's a very toxic plant too. And for those of you with sensitive skin, you may have found as you're working with it, it feels a little prickly. It might feel a little off. And that's because it's a plant that a lot of folks have contact dermatitis with. Um, they'll just break out in the slightest little rash. It's nothing usually that they need to go see a doctor. It might be something they need to go in and wash their hands, sort of like rue and yarrow. Um, some folks might find when they're working with those plants, it might cause a slight rash on the back of their hands or if they touch their face. Lantana is a beautiful plant it's, again, good for pollinators, but just be aggressive with that plant and keep it in a zone where it's going to be happy, 
but it's not able to really take over. So I have mine actually next to our gardenia. I have it also next to, um, my brain just went dead, hawthorn, North American hawthorn. And the North American hawthorn, at first I was a little nervous. I thought the lantana was winning the battle. This year my hawthorn has taken up a step and it is pushed in and it's actually done a good job. Both of them are corralling the lantana into the shape that I want. Now keep in mind the um, gardenia next to it is about 12, 13 years old. So it was a well-established plant. Then came the lantana. So the hawthorn's a baby, but like I said, that hawthorn is a native plant. It's found where it's happy and it's just not gonna put up with the lantana, which is a good thing. <laughs> if you're worried about deer and bunnies, you do want to have lantan in your garden because typically deers and bunnies will not come to it. Again, it's good for butterflies, your bees that are first coming out in the spring. Um, if you, I've never seen it in this area. I did a couple times in the Piedmont. Lantana would oftentimes be an early bloomer, but down here it reacts totally different to what I've seen in the Piedmont, which surprises me because it's dealing with harsher conditions there than it is down here. So I don't know what's going on with the difference. I'm convinced that Lantana actually loves the red clay mm -hmm. of the Piedmont Triad because there was quite a few plants up there that folks would tell me don't like red clay, they're not gonna do well. And I had plants that were flourishing up there even when it was dried and cracked that shouldn't have been doing well. I think it was the mineral content or something. I that's into botany and a realm I'm not all familiar with. Now, speaking of species we like in our garden for their flowers, daffodils are another plant that folks will have in their garden. If you've ever picked a fresh daffodil and put it in a vase with other flowers, you may have noticed your other flowers aren't doing too well afterwards. And that's because daffodils within their first bit of cutting release a sap that is actually gonna go up into the stems of the other plants and it's gonna, in a way, suffocate them. So, what you can do is cut your daffodils, put them in their own vials of water, overnight, six to eight hours, rinse them, plop them in with your other flowers, and they'll do fine. You talk to any florist or someone that works with bouquets on a regular basis, and they're all gonna tell you that. You Google it on the internet, and it's like a crime scene. They're gonna be like, daffodils kill everything. You can't ever put daffodils in a vase. They're an evil plant. It just, if you take care of it and put it in water for a little bit and then transfer it over, if you've ever wanted a beautiful spring uh, bouquet of all kinds of bulbed flowers, along with maybe some others that are coming in at that time, you can easily do that with your daffodils. And finally, plants in our garden. I'm gonna end it with probably the most nefarious plant that really makes me nervous when people tell me they want it in the yard, and that is Oriolander. I'm sorry, it's a beautiful plant, but it is a evil, evil plant. <laughs> um, it's very toxic. If you want to have it in your garden, fine, but just be aware, it's very toxic. Don't ever burn it. If you cut it, wear gloves, be very careful, and keep small children, dogs, and cats, and again, that random adult that likes to put things in their mouth, keep them away from it. It is a very, very poisonous plant, and it is ranked by many, many people as a very dangerous plant to have in your garden. So again, if you're aware of what these plants can do, still have them in your garden, just give them maybe a wider berth or make sure you're wearing protective gloves when you're working with it. Um, but the problem that we'll see with actually Lantana and Orlander, whenever folks go into areas where they've become a little more invasive and they've had to cut them and work with them, workers with Lantana have developed respiratory problems. It's not permanent, but they'll have them that day. Those working with Orlander will have um, skin problems along with breathing problems. Um, think of it as sort of like soft wood. You never bring it into your home to burn. That's a wood you burn outside. So that said, because we're in October and we're nearing Halloween, I am going to finalize this talk before we get to questions, which is um, what I'm gonna call a witch's herbal. Just kind of things that historically you would have either used to keep the witches at bay or what witches might have been using 
I use that with air quotes, um, <laughs> as kind of something that they liked or maybe would use to fly. Um, rowan and juniper were both plants that were considered good for boats, but ironically, if you put the two together in your home, your home was to catch fire. It was considered uh, very ill fortune to have it in your home. But if you put a juniper branch and a rowan boat, it was going to be a great boat. It was never going to sink. <laughs> Angelica, you can guess by the name, witches can't touch this plant. It's called Angelica. It's named after the angels. Um, it was considered to be a protection against witches. You go over to certain parts of Europe, and the stalks are still candied and eaten today, um, especially around the springtime when you would have had spring festivals where people, again, were nervous about witches, especially on Walpurgis night, which was the night that they supposedly all gathered. It, it depends on where you lived, what mountain they're gathering on, but they would gather on a mountain, and they would have feasting and festivities, but if you were eating an angelic stock during this time period, you did not have to worry about witches. They weren't going to come near you. Witches also do not like fennel or flax. I don't know. <laughs> it's because they didn't like the fact that both fennel and flax would have been used domestically or why. Supposedly with flax, they did not like the color blue that the flowers put off. Anise or anise, if you're a fan of that licorice-like flaving spice, you might have a witch in your heritage because supposedly witches love, love this seasoning. <laughs> uh, bear's garlic, they liked. But here's the interesting thing, you could also make a potion out of it and use it against witches, so I'm not sure how that worked. <laughs> Chevrolet was a 10th century Anglo-Saxon herb that today we tend to just not think of unless we're mixing it in with our goat cheese but historically was actually a very popular herb, not just in your Anglo-Saxon times, but also into further time period of the medieval um, era. You also see nettles being commonly used. Um, this one plant called waybread, which we would call broadleaf plantain. That's a plant today we just look at as a roadside weed. We don't pay any attention to it. But this was actually considered a very important food source historically, just like the dandelion. So it's just amazing to me how you'll see plants today that we just kind of look at, but for a much longer period were actually considered a very important plant and would have been recognized by most folks. And then dill was used for love potions, and ironically, witches loved it too, and I've got a little bit of dill over there. Now, if you ever want to make a flying ointment, <laughs> you can make it with, and it's no wonder you're going to fly with this ointment, <laughs> Belladonna, Opium, Hemlock, Henbane, Hellborn, Monk's Hood. You mix a little black or bat's blood in, and then the fat of your choice, children, cats, wolves, oh. and then you mix it all together. You then either put this on your broom or you put this on yourself. And I actually got this from um, a book. I didn't bring them with me today. I forgot to bring them. I can always send the link out later. Uh, she's a folklorist, and she has two books out. I love it. It's called The Night of the Witches, and the other one's the, I think it's The Dark Magic of Christmas. And they're both absolutely wonderful because it is talking about more of agrarian societies and how people kind of related to the seasons before modern electricity and a lot of other things. And, you know, I had a friend that read the book and was like, I don't know. But if you do look through history records or historical records and folklore and such like that, a lot of it is true. And even if you go to certain parts of Europe today some of these festivals are still performed. They might be in small towns, but they might be still performed just because it, it's a big part of the local community. Now, uh, that said, I've got some plants up here if you wanted to look at them. Um, this book up here, American Household Botany, is an amazing reference book to have. Um, the author is up at Harvard. She's a botanist. And I just love referencing her book, even whenever I'm like, okay, I remember vaguely that this was used in baking, but what other plant would they have used at that time period in this region? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and thank you all for coming. Yes. <laughs>
you mentioned um, wisteria when you were mentioning things that might be poisonous. Yeah, I know it's invasive. Yes. What's poisonous? It's um, basically going to be the almost all of it, but most of it is going to be like your flowers and then the berries that come off of it. The seed pods. The seed pods, yes. Um, and that one again, it, it's you can mess with it quite a bit. It's unless you have some form of an, an allergy to it, you're not going to have a, a huge problem. It's going to be more so if you have a cat or dog that is notorious for just kind of going up to plants and chewing on them. They're the species you're going to want to watch with wisteria. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I was going to say on oleander too, they have the big seed pods. You know, the yes, big it's, big it's every part. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, I have a friend and he's talking about putting it all over his yard. And I'm like, I, I guess so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, and I work over on Bullhead Island and you see it, bless you, um, over there in, in certain areas. Although on Bullhead, you're really not supposed to be bringing invasive plants in or growing invasive plants. So it is beautiful. I, I really think it is. And I'm not saying you can't have it. Just be very much aware that it is a plant you should handle with care when you have it in your yard. Um, you said that uh, mint in really high doses can cause seizures like wormwood. Mm -hmm. Uh, is that from Dujon? It is, yes. So mint also has Dujon. Yes. So does sage, rosemary, lavender, um, all your plants that fall into that umbrella family. And again, it's going to be very, very, very large concentrations of it. I mean, if you're sitting there looking at someone and saying, this is how I'm going to take them out, <laughs> you, you would have to do quite a, a large dosage, which... I don't know. Maybe there is someone that written a, a mystery novel where someone's died that way, but it's probably one of the reasons it's not one of the plants that it's worked its way into how someone was killed. Is it would have to be a I don't know the exact amount you would have to be, but it seems like anything I've even read, whether it's a botanist or a chemist, they all say the same thing. It's got to be an extremely large dosage. Why can't we mojitos? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just keep slipping into that person. But you're actually, before they even get to death, you're, you're going to see the seizures kicking first. That's funny. Any other well, questions? Have luck, and then there's um, the one I do. I can't remember right now, but hemlock is very poisonous. Exactly, it's, it is. It yes. And then you have, um, you have so many plants that look like, let's say, dill flowers or Queen's Anne's lace that fall into your poisons. It's kind of like how I, I look at plants is how one should look at mushrooms too. If you're looking at it, you're like, I'm really not sure what you are. Just leave me. Enjoy it in its setting and then meander on. Um, I feel like too often we get a little too comfortable with the plants that we're growing. We assume because we get it from a garden center that it's, there's nothing wrong with it. And I mean, I've even seen people that are like, oh, I go foraging and I eat things all the time. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> if anything, even if you're picking something out of nature, that doesn't mean it's clean. That doesn't mean a bird hasn't flown over or a fox hasn't gone by. So, I mean, it's there's going to be things maybe on said plant that should be washed and cleaned. But I find it interesting that plants that we vilify and will eradicate from our yard and hiss when we see it are sometimes very beneficial and good. And then plants that we coddle and coo over, like your hydrangea, and we'll be like, oh, I wanna change your flowers. Let's add a little alum to the soil or something like that, is actually a plant that outside of looks, as far as human species goes, we don't really get too much out of it. Now, there are plant species here that I've listed that are bad for humans and might be bad for cats and dogs, but that's not to say it's not good for bees and butterflies or your other insects that might um, do some form of pollinating out there. I'm sorry, that was a lot to like. <laughs> and I hope I didn't go to, off too many rabbit holes as I went along all the way. But thank you all for, for coming in. Thank you.